So you're with us on the Made It Music Podcast. We're here in the studio with Jason B. Jones and Josh Wurzelbacher, both creative directors at Integrity and at Centricity Music. We're going to be diving into their stories today. Thank you guys so much for being with us on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. We're stoked. Let's talk about, first of all, even before we dive in, just get, just give us maybe each from each of your perspectives before we dive into your stories. What is a creative director in the first place? Mm. I made a joke earlier that I think that it's uh, janitorial services. But um, <laughs> I mean, I would say I think it really – I feel like we have to be the advocates for visual language at a, at a record label. Mm-hmm. Um, all of the profit and loss around in the music industry is all about – the, the written word and, and songs. And there's a very uh, important caveat to all that, which is making sure that there's a visual cohesion to the story that we're trying to tell. And so as a creative director, m- my job is to be sort of the third um, leg on the stool, uh, really partnering with A&R and marketing to make sure that there's a compelling visual story that coincides with the sonic story and product that they're trying to create. Yeah. And to make sure that visually it makes sense with who that artist is, um, to really tell their story as an artist, to, to make sure that what you're seeing makes sense with what you're hearing, mm. that all that is, is cohesive together. Cause you could have a cohesive visual brand, but if it doesn't, if it doesn't look like what it sounds like, or if it's not authentic to who that artist is, it's a failure. Mm. Yeah. And authenticity is is so important now. I think even more so than ever before because there's just this white noise of, of content that's coming out all the time that I would say that especially the Christian consumer is really looking for something that they can connect with emotionally. Mm. And if it's not authentic, they can smell that a mile away. Mm. And so our job is to really extract when we're working with an artist, who, who really, who are you and what are you trying to tell uh, people that is unique to what God has placed in your heart, in your life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so good. I want to put a bookmark there and come back to that because that authenticity conversation is so, so important with whether you're a Christian artist or rock rock and roll. Yeah, for sure. Man. Yeah. Um, let's talk about, first of all, just each of your stories, maybe just a couple minutes on how did you get into music? How did you get to where you're at now? What does what that journey um, kind of looked like? You want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I... I got into music uh, as a fan early. Uh, I grew up, you know, my dad listened to soul. So it was a lot of temptations and four tops and James Brown and that kind of stuff. My mom was more into to fifties and sixties rock and roll. So good, good, good musical upbringing there. Yeah, it was great. So there was a lot of that kind of influence. And then as I got into middle school and high school and discovered punk rock and hardcore and that kind of stuff, I kind of found my world. Um, and so that was just always a thing that I really connected with, uh, was that community, especially as I got into punk rock and, and finding community in that, that music was just really, uh, important to who I was and what I was experiencing. And so it's always been kind of a part of my personal ethos. Yeah. Uh, and so started bands in college and high school and stuff and was on that side of music for a long time. Um, <clears throat> took a while before I went and, and really started doing art, but I was, I was working at a, uh, university in their marketing department as a designer and through a mutual friend when, uh, when Jason was at Capitol, uh, they were looking for a new designer and we got connected and it worked out. So it was kind of, I wasn't really looking to get into doing creative and music. Um, otherwise, I mean, I was making gig posters and stuff for, friends bands and that kind of stuff but as far as like doing it like career wise i hadn't even thought that that was really an option uh and then you know you call it divine intervention or whatever the that opportunity came up and and i jumped and it was a good fit and i guess the rest is history yeah (laughs) and you're currently at centricity music currently at centricity music i spent about uh, a little over three years with capitol records learned a ton had a great time uh 
love a lot of the people there uh, and had an opportunity to move over to Centricity as creative director. Been there about a year and a half uh, and absolutely love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic. Awesome. Well, it's great. Great crew. You're, you're in good company there. So yeah. Chad Segura, who's, uh, who's been mentioned on your podcast, I believe. Well, he's been, he's been on the Many podcast. Times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I had to at least put his name out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's an incredible crew, uh, of people that just really want to serve and yeah, it's, it's great. That's awesome. Jason. Yeah. So my musical upbringing was, I was a, a church youth group praise band choir kid. Um, I, uh, I was in church since I was five and, and grew up in, uh, really great youth groups that had bands and, uh, th- and then the, what the youth group also had a youth choir. And so, um, I, I found out early on that, that I had an affinity or an enjoyment of, of singing and participating in those. And so much so, and I don't share this very often that I was in a, uh, scholarship singing group in college. Wow. Uh, let me paint the picture for you. Uh, <laughs> this is the type of I'm singing group. robes. Oh, no, 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 better, better. <laughs> this is, um, like four girls, four guys, um, all the same suit, but different colors, uh, like stepping forward and singing to Avalon tracks. Oh, man. Um, oh, man. And we would, we would, I went to Houston Baptist University and we went around and it, we were sort of a recruitment tool. And, and I am so immensely thankful that all of this happened before YouTube. I'm a little older, <laughs> yep. but if YouTube had existed, I'm, I'm, I think I'm not sure I would have any Did credibility Did it have a really great name, like the Sword Bearers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but that's better. What was no, it was Focus. Uh, it was and a we more had, progressive. And we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had I a, guess Sword Bearers is a little Southern Baptist. We had a, yeah, well, this was a Southern Baptist school. Maybe they're just trying to be hip. But I don't hip, know. Was it like yeah. an acronym? Oh, I, I, maybe, but I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> but I had a, this is terrible. I can't believe I'm admitting this. But in one of the songs, I had a rap. Mm. Yeah, you do. Um, and uh, I and maybe maybe in some bonus content I can. Do, do you the remember rap, the rap? Yeah, I know. I remember the rap. Well, you're setting yourself uh, up now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Gosh, that can't. You got to do. You can't just like. <clears throat> All right. You realize this. I don't going know if this is copyright. I know. I know. I know. I know. Um, it was uh. From the G to the R to the E to the A T, you probably know, but you still got a big need for the some, for the one called the Sun. Here we go. Send done. Drop a little reminder that God is not the only one, or still the only one. <laughs> Toby Mac who? No, it wasn't exactly. Toby. I don't even know. That was terrible. That was terrible. Anyway. That's amazing. Amazing. So uh so your success there yeah, as a yeah. rap artist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I can't believe Open I just many did doors. That. that's gonna be on the internet. That's right. It's gonna be on the internet. Um and I'm gonna have like people that I went to college like <laughs> trolling now. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> you asked for it. I know. I, you even warned me. Yeah. Anyway, out of that, um out of, after college I um helped to uh, found and I owned a company called Otterball, which was um, a marketing website that built uh, websites and and different sort of creative assets for artists. And the whole thing was I loved music so much, but you know the idea of being an artist just wasn't my gifting. I mean, I my dad was a uh, is a painter and a fine artist, and so I kind of had that in my DNA, and I loved it. And and this was a way to really marry the two, like to work with musicians and also be super creative. And so, um, we ran that, that started in 2005 and, um, I had a chance to work on some projects for capital. Um, I think the one that I remember specifically is I did some stuff for Josh Wilson at the time and, uh, Brad O'Donnell's a a dear friend of mine. He's the now co-president over at capital CMG. And when they had an opportunity, an opening for a, a, I think it was a creative marketing director position. Um, he brought me in and it was, it was a dream job. I mean, I was working on things that I would have never imagined working on. And then, um, and then from that I, I went over to integrity music where I'm the director of marketing and creative services. Um, and where we're really focusing on, uh, worship and worship expression in music, which is just, I pinch myself because like you're sitting there worshiping and deep diving in your faith. And that's your job to really try to figure out how to come alongside someone whose entire mission is just to create 
songs that are vertical in nature. It's yeah. it's just really cool. Yeah, that's um, awesome. So let's talk about the importance of creative. Um, I know that you've shared that it's it's the whole uh, paradox of do people actually buy a book based on the cover or, or based on the author? Maybe you can share a little bit with our audience on that. Just the importance of the visual aspect and how you guys think about it in your, your respective roles. Yeah, I think, I think it's obviously super important because there's a lot of noise. I forget, I forget how many songs are added to Spotify every day. It's some ridiculous number. And, and we're trying to cut through all that noise with something and you can get playlisting and you can get uh, all of the kind of marketing things to help on that side, but it still has to look good. Um, And I think a big part of that is making sure that it looks good all the way down. So, you know, you've kind of got this funnel from discovery to fandom Mm. and, and you want people to take that journey uh, from first hearing you on a playlist to, you know, ideally purchasing a record or, or, or coming to see you live and getting them to come down that funnel, I think includes having a really strong, authentic visual brand that, that is consistent and helps the listener have a visual connection with that music mm. that, that tells another part of the story. Um, and I think it's, it, it's just as important now as ever. We're not fighting necessarily for shelf space, um, but we're, we're trying to go a step further yeah. and we're trying to, to create fans and, and engage in a way that things become shareable, that you, they, they become part of the conversation and having a firm understanding of, of the visuals is really, I think, imperative to that. Yeah. And, and when I started and you as well, we, we, we would engage with an artist once every two years for a two or three month stint because the release cycle was so you know an artist would make a record and then they wouldn't really make another one until two years later so we had this like we're we're best friends for three months where we have to get a bunch of stuff done and then you move on to the next artist i would say that the biggest difference in creative now versus when i started is with the um you know with a single base culture where it's about adding singles every 30 to 90 days in order to be able to keep your listener really engaged with who you are, we're having to work with the artist continuously to try and figure out how do we get more content? Because the the beast out there, the the consumer wants content. As soon as you give it to them, they're ready for something else. (laughs) So there was this moment where it was like, okay, cool. Here's our entire campaign. Here's a beautiful cover. Here's a beautiful music video. And that's really all you needed in order to be able to really launch an artist. Now it's, it's, it's micro content. You need a, a fire hose of content in order to really bring in a new audience, especially for a new artist. A new artist has an uphill battle. Um, And I would say that the best artists that, that I work with are people who already understand, um, uh, that they need to continually create content. Mm -hmm. And our job is just to level it up. Like, Mm -hmm. how do we really make it, um, better? How do we take a little bit of the pressure off of the artist by helping them build process around making all of that content and then keeping a vision across the whole campaign? Yeah, that's, that's daunting. And, and I want to come back to the shareability discussion because you, touch, you touched on it. So we'll actually do a deep dive after the interview on how do you even – it's not only making content, but you got to make good content that mm-hmm. actually makes people want to click share mm-hmm. on it. And that's how things go viral. Um, so we will do a deep dive on that. People can check that out at the madeitinmusic.com show notes for this episode if they're interested. Um, but let's talk a little bit about that fire hose. Like how have you guys had to adapt in your roles um, – does it just require more manpower? Does it require better systems? How, how do you, you know, how do you handle that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of other people listening to this yeah. thinking, okay, well, I don't have a creative director. How in the world as a new artist do I keep up with that? I think one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, it's more important now than ever to have an authentic voice of the artist. Um, because it used to be like, you could, you could have a great photo shoot and you could shoot a music video and you'd have a great cover and you'd launch that out into the marketplace and it would live for two years. And, and that was kind of it. 
And so if it wasn't really who the artist was, it was okay because it was a marketing thing and people still bought the record. Where now it's every day my artist is posting on Instagram. And and if it's not real to who he or she is and what they're what they're doing and what their mission is and what they're creating, that's that's easily somebody's gonna see through that. They're gonna see through the marketing, they're gonna see through the photo shoot that wasn't who that person really is. They're going to see through that music video that didn't quite capture who that person is uh, because they're seeing content ideally more often and getting a better picture of who that artist really is. So I think uh, a key to that is, is really genuinely finding out who that artist is as a human being, what they do naturally, kind of what the expression of their music is in their daily life uh, is, is, really important to that because we can't, we can't just create stuff for them to post every day and make a new well-produced, you know, 30 second clip for them to put on Instagram every day or whatever it is. They've, they've got to take some ownership of it. And I think making sure that all of that matches who that person is, is really vital to that so that they can, they can own it and run with it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Because if you ask an artist like, Hey, I need you, you know, what's really, um, uh, popular right now is vlogging. Hey, artist who doesn't do that at all, I need you to start a daily vlog. Like you're going to have an uphill battle and you will never get that authentic expression from that artist. So I feel like what we do as creative directors is you have to identify one, what makes that artist special, like what is their unique voice? And two, what is an easy overflow of what they naturally want to do? And how do we make that better? So, you know, like I'm thinking about some of our artists who are already, you know, pretty active on socials. What we just need to do is to tweak and refine. I don't want to say, hey, let's add something to what you're doing that is unnatural because I know that, that it just is not going to be successful. It's go and the artist is then going to resent the platform of the process. So we really have to do our best to figure out how to just naturally amplify what they're already doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like making the best version of who they already yeah. are. Yeah, so how do you, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's different with, with every artist, but how do you help your artists uh, make it a manageable task? Like mm -hmm. if you're just literally asking, like you said, the vlog example, if, if an artist has zero experience putting out vlogs or really doing any video, is that going to be something that you're just going to avoid altogether with them? Or is that like, okay, um, we need to hire a video person to follow them around 24 seven or whatever. How, how do you guys systematize that <laughs> yeah. for your artists? So it's actually doable and they can still focus on really what their, their special sauce is, which is making great music. <laughs> For me, and, and I don't know if this resonates with you, Joshua, is that for me, it's a lot about resource management. So okay. it's like trying to figure out how much do we have from just a, a you know, real world resources? What, what is the money that we have from a creative perspective to be able to invest in this artist in order to be able to get the most content possible? And then what can we add um, to what they're already doing? And then what do we need to completely supplement? So, you know, some, to your point, some artists might not know at all how to do video. Well, immediately, I'm not going to try to get them to do that. I'm going to bring someone alongside of them. Maybe it's mm -hmm. going out on tour with the artist to capture B-roll. Maybe it's an editor. Um, this is something we've been doing more lately is, yeah, the artist is great about capturing stuff on their phone and, and doing vlog style videos, but they have hard drives of this and they have no time or or really um, affinity to edit it. So then it's bringing an editor alongside them, investing in that to then take all of that and create it into content. So like for the independent artists, I think that it's really figuring out who can you collaborate with that is already good at the things that you want to pursue. Like find someone who's a good vlogger and then try to figure out how to partner with them because mm. it benefits that vlogger as well to have someone who's also good at music. There's a lot of ways from an independent perspective to find people who are naturally good at other things and really create this sort of a team of of people that are all trying to work together. I love that because that's something that doesn't cost anything. I yep. think a lot of people you talked about resources 
really for most people when they're starting out, what they're what the resource that they have is is time, and they have a limited right. amount of it. Some have access to some money, some finite money, but those strategic alliances, let's call them. What what can a musician bring to somebody like a blogger or a vlogger? Mm-hmm. Um, who like h- how would that conversation look? Yeah, so the I, I think that a musician inherently is going to be a good audio editor. Um, I mean, s- sometimes they're at least going to be a little bit more familiar with you know uh, sonically making something that sounds appealing, whereas a video person is going to make something from a video perspective that's going to make it vid- appealing via video. So that seems like a really natural marriage to me to be able to help one each other yeah. make a better product. So you know, I know that a lot of times vloggers are looking for you know, unique audio or, or music to be able to put in their vlogs. Well, you work with a musician that you can craft some of those things together. I think that that also comes with working with visual artists like graphic designers, you know, like a graphic designer will oftentimes need some of those things as well to be able to use for their uh, promotion and their marketing. So when I was starting out with Otterball, that was the thing that we learned how to do really well is how do we barter services and just build great relationships. And that has then carried over in how strategically I can work on um, label projects who might be under-resourced because it's just an an artist starting out. We don't have a lot of marketing budget. So how do we figure out how to build a team and still have a very high quality product with a, with a modest budget? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's good. I think kind of backing up to the beginning of that conversation too, one of the things that, that we've noticed um, and that our team has started implementing is helping artists figure out kind of what their mission statement is. Mm-hmm. And if you can help an artist, at least from our perspective, understand how vlogging, for example, fits into that mission statement, even if they haven't done it before, all of a sudden they go, oh, okay, I get it. I, I see why this is important. Let me give it a try. And so helping, helping introduce them to new things, understanding how this benefits their mission, um, will quickly help them kind of get on board and, it, and, and even want to do it, um, and be excited about it. So I, I think that's as much of the conversation of like the nuts and bolts of how we're going to do this, of getting the right people in the room to make things happen is also helping each other understand, okay, why are we doing it? Mm. Why is this important to, you know, why are we making a vlog about what outfit you're wearing <laughs> yeah. uh, when you're trying to sell records? Yeah. Like, how does this benefit each other? And so helping understand that that why behind the how uh, for an artist, I think, is, is Man, important too. Can you too. talk a li- expand on that too? Because that's, I think a lot of artists think, well, I, I like, I, I can't remember one of you guys said, like, an artist is just really good at doing music and like, I don't know how to do any of this other stuff. How do you, how how does that conversation go with somebody that's like okay no that people actually do want to see your you know in some cases your how do you do your makeup for your shows or how do you pick out your outfits or maybe you have a little cooking thing that like maybe has nothing to do with music mm-hmm. like is that at all a part of the conversation I, I, yeah it is and and I think it's because uh, we're all human and. And because of the internet, and we, we kind of get this peek behind the curtain at each other's lives, we're showing, you know, oftentimes a, a very manicured version of that peak, but we, we do show behind the scenes. And so we're, we're so used to seeing that in people's lives online that we get excited that like, oh, look, this musical artist that I'm into also likes to make Thai food. That's interesting. And it, and it fills out that person as a whole. So it takes them from being, oh yeah, that guy does that one song that I like to, oh, this is a person that I'm getting to know and understand. So it's kind of a more holistic view of, of promotion of you as a human being. Uh, and, and the music is part of that. That's, that's what you're passionate about. That's where you make your money. That's what you want to do, but you still are, are the culmination of all these other things. And that's what people want to know is like who you are. So it kind of goes back to that authenticity thing and like what are you passionate about what are you excited about and for us like that's that's the conversation we have up front with an artist when the whole process begins of before we ever set up a photo shoot before we ever design a, an album cover it comes down to like having a conversation with that artist what are they into what are they drawn to what are they excited about besides just their music like what yeah. what's your favorite sports team 
What's your favorite shoe brand? When you go out to eat, where do you like to go? All of those things are, are key into who that person is that we can, we can find ways to kind of work into that bigger brand uh, and explain that to a, to a consumer. And that has evolved. So I would say that that is a, an enlightened um, position that is fairly new, I would say, in our careers. Because what, what we spent a lot of time doing just even a few years ago was making um, story behind the song videos that play out a little bit like this. It's um, two guys sitting on stools that say, yeah, I, we had this scheduled co-write and we thought, how can we write this really great song? And, you know, I pulled up in my Range Rover and this other guy pulled up in his Porsche and we said, you know, what does God really want to hear out of his people? And we figured out how to make the next hit. Like, yeah. and it wasn't relatable or authentic at all. I yeah. mean, it was, it was factual, <laughs> you know, yeah. it was actually what happened, but it didn't really speak to who those people are or why that song is important to people in churches who are going through, you know, trials and uh, broken homes and m broken marriages and illness. And when they see two people that live in big houses writing songs about God, we, we did a lot of those videos. And we're, we're beginning to realize, or I think we've all realized, that what people really need is emotional connections to other humans um, and not, they don't need to necessarily see how um, this art was manufactured, mm. if that makes sense. So it sounds like storytelling is a pretty big key element of what you guys do as creative directors. Yeah, it's, it's visually storytelling and it's, it's making sure that the album cover looks like the promo shots, looks like the Instagram, looks like the music video, so that you're getting a cohesive story. And each of those things, even the things like the you know, cooking vlogs or whatever, they, they tell a part of that story. Yeah. Um, and it, it is. It's a, it's a part of the bigger brand of who, who the artist is as, as, a, as a human being. So who, whose job is it to come up with the, let's call it the vision, the visual vision and, and, and that story that they want to tell is it, is it a creative director or is it, is it the artist? Um, I would say that every artist that we work with comes in from a different place. Um, I can remember artists that I worked with, like you mentioned, that's like, I'm really good at music and that's what I do, but I have no idea really visually what I want. I mean, and we will start to ask those questions. We always, I come in always assuming that they're, they're having, they have some vision and sometimes you'll say like, so what do you really think? What are you thinking about from like a look and feel perspective? And they go, well, here, let me roll out this scroll of all the notes I've taken. You're like, okay, cool, good, good. We can work with that. And then there are many that are like, I have no idea. What do you think? And everyone is different. Every artist, um, sometimes they come to the table needing you to do everything. Um, in, in the case of a lot of integrities artists that are tied in with a, a large church, they have an entire creative department who that, whose horsepower really is a factor in creating all of those assets. So everyone is a bit different. And what we're trying to do is really um, find the, uh, the gold in all of those things and really pull out how do we how do we really pull all of those things together in order to be able to come up with that strategy um, but that looks really different artist to artist yeah my favorite thing is when an artist comes in and they're like i know exactly what i want and here's here's what it is and it's i'm making this smart pop record uh it's going to be fantastic uh and the cover is going to have, you know, this death metal look to it. And, you know, I want all black everything and there's going to be snakes and blood. And you're like, <laughs> cool, um, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. And you and you kind of work through, you know, some of those ideas. Those are always such fun conversations. I want it to be really clean, but also kind of gritty and organic. And you're yeah. like, you know, those are like opposite words, right? <laughs> those mean quite I don't, literally. I don't think those words mean what you think they, they mean. They don't mean what you think they mean. Yes. Yeah. So there, there is totally an element often, uh, I shouldn't say often, but many times of having to help craft and hone what they think they mean down to what they do really mean. Yeah. So I, I want to peek into the, the actual nuts and bolts of the process. Like if I'm an artist that comes to you, I'm, I'm middle of the road. Mm -hmm. I have a decent idea of what I think I want things to look like, but I don't necessarily know 
what the steps are. What what does it look like? Like what does that meeting look like? Have have you guys pre prepared some ideas? Has the artist brought some ideas to the table? Um, like walk us through maybe the steps in in the process. Yeah, yeah. Ours our process starts uh, with getting to know the artist. So oftentimes it'll be coffee or a meal and just purely hanging out. We're not going to talk about creative. I just want to get to know you. Um, and so we'll do that. And then I have a creative questionnaire. That's probably 25 questions that I'll email them. And if they have a manager, copy the manager on it. And uh, it, it's everything from what's your favorite shoe brand to if you were a color, what color would it be? Like just seemingly random questions that kind of help us get to know more about them and what they're into. And I will often ask them then to put together a Pinterest board of things that you like. It does, You don't have to tell me why you like them. It doesn't have to be another artist that you like. Like it could be a logo that you thought was cool. Uh, a birthday invitation that you got in the mail that you just really like the color of. Or a photograph from when you were at the beach and you just really love the way it makes you feel. I want you to collect all those things so we can take a look at it. And then we'll, we'll kind of talk through that and, and take a look at it and kind of get their feedback on why they put these things together. Yeah. Uh, and then I have a creative manager that works with me and between the two of us, we'll kind of distill down all of that information into a couple solid ideas of where we think the artist is going, uh, what they're into, kind of what, really encapsulates what's happening in their mind. Uh, we put together a creative document that uh, kind of says, all right, here's here's some other pictures, uh, some photographs from a studio or from out in the wild that we think really kind of are what you're getting at. Here's some colors, here are some fonts. And we put all that together, share that with the artist, and they go, yeah, this is totally me. I feel this. This is right. Yeah. Or they'll go, eh, this this, I don't like this picture. Can we take this one off there? Yeah. Can we, can we add this one on that I found? And you kind of have this back and forth conversation, honing that down to something that everybody goes, yeah, this is where we're headed. Uh, and then we take that and then we start making decisions based off that solid kind of document that says, um, this is, this is visually what we're trying to accomplish. And then we start talking to photographers and video directors and, you know, graphic designers, if we need somebody to create something or illustrators, and you, you then start to put all of the people together that it's going to take to, to accomplish that mm -hmm. document. Um, and then that gives us something that everybody's on the same page and we can always go back to that and say, is this choice we're making, does that decision line up with with who the artist is, with what we talked about. Yeah. Uh, so it gives us all a good jumping off point. So, so well, go, go ahead. If you're, if you're going to add to that. Yeah. I mean, our process is similar. He, yeah. he has some tools that we don't, and, and we, we do things like we, we have a formalized sort of hang that it, there's a lot of different people involved, but all of it is pretty much the same. I would say the only addition to that, and I'm sure you do the same thing is it's super important to me to engage with a and R as early in the process as possible, because I need to know what themes are coming out of the writing process. Because a lot of times there's a, um, there's something's moving. There's this, there's a, a spiritual nature to what in our industry, God is telling that artist that he might not even know yet as he's writing with co-writes, as he's in the studio recording. So anytime I, I can hear roughs or I can even go to the studio and feel like what are those themes that are emerging, um, it also helps me build relationship with the artist when I get engaged. So when I come to the artist and say, hey, I've listened to what you're writing, I've I've listened to your songs, I've been in the studio, tell me if I'm wrong, but I really feel like this story of redemption is what co is coming out of what you're trying to say and connecting on a heart level makes all of the education around visuals so much easier because there's immediate trust. It's not just that, yeah, we can make a, a, a packaging that is, you know, market <clears throat> viable in the, the market, or we can make a killer music video is, do you really understand mm. that artist and what they're trying to say? And so, yes, all of what Joshua was talking about, we do all that, but it's so important. I know it's important for him as well to make sure that we know who they are before we start any of that. Mm, that's good. So let's say I'm a up and coming musician that comes to you guys and I want to up my creative game. What are some of the key skills that I need to be developing? Key skills. Um, I mean, 
I think a spirit of collaboration uh, to begin with is, is a big thing to be able to say, I, I want to work with people. We want to work together. We, we have the same goal in mind. Um, and to be, you know, as artists, you know, cause we're visual artists and, and you as a musical artist, there's still creativity is, is a common language between us. And so if we can get on the same page emotionally and kind of talk about those things and establish trust and uh, a willingness to work together, I think is really a, a big part of that. And, and maybe taking some time to figure out what it is that you really like, yeah, what you're really into. Um, that's super helpful. Yeah. For me, it's, I want to know that the artist is working as hard or harder than we are. Um, I think it's, it's challenging when you have an artist who really just want you to, to make everything and they sit back and evaluate it's, it's fun. And I feel like productive when that artist is hustling and working as hard as you are, because it's all about that spirit of collaboration. I think that artists, oftentimes they're really confident in their musical abilities because that's, you know, obviously they're working with us because they're great musicians. They need to have that level of abandon with visual and video and all of that. Just don't be afraid because I think that in, in the world that we live in now, um, you can you can afford to be more raw and authentic than you've ever ha have before and that that's actually respected. So just get out there and create and build your community. We can help hone. But if you have just the ethos to go in there and just make and make and make, that's going to that's gonna be a recipe for success. Yeah. And in the beginning, a lot of it's DIY. So yeah. should they learn like Photoshop? Should they learn video? Should they, or should they not worry so much about that kind of stuff? I mean, I think that's one of those things that you use your community. Mm -hmm. So you find somebody in your church or, or at school that does or has dabbled in graphic design and you, you start to build and define those people that you want to work with. And that's when it's most successful mm -hmm. is when, you know, you write songs really well. So you write songs really well and you find somebody to help you yeah. with, with your visuals. Cause it, n nobody's going to be, aces at everything. Yeah. And so if your passion is songwriting, stick with songwriting and find the people, surround yourself with other creatives mm. that can really help you with the rest of that and, and trust them. Yeah. Just like you, you would, if you're creating something for their, you know, they ask you to, Hey, could you write a song, a theme song for my podcast? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they're going to, you want them to trust you that, Hey, you've asked me to do this because you, you see something in me that, you know, we want to work on this together. Um, it it kind of goes the other way too. It's like, let's have some trust. Let's build some trust with each other and, and work this through because we both want success at yeah. the end. And, and I think on our end, so anybody that's looking to get into the creative side, uh, a big part of that is trusting your artist and being, being willing to, I think you kind of said this at the top is like, it's not about me and my visual art and what I'm going to create. I'm going to make a name for myself in making album covers. It's, it's about the artist yeah. and, and creating what's real to them and, you know, propping up. People are buying this for the music. They're mm -hmm. not buying it because my album cover was so cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it just really needs to support the music. And to be super cliche, like no one climbs a mountain alone. Like you have yeah. to have Sherpas and mentors around you. We have it. I mean, yeah. I have music video directors who I don't have business talking to. They're so talented yet. You know, I could call them right now and they would give me advice. Um, I think that the creative community, especially in the music industry and, and even um, closer to home in Nashville is so we're, everyone is so willing to share. There's, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of competition because we're all trying to, uh, really make something that is meaningful. And, and, and in the Christian community, we all know that all of this serves a higher purpose. Like it's all to point people to Jesus, everything mm -hmm. that we do. And so, um, I think that there's a lot of openness to share. There's, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of, um, people holding much close to their vest anymore because we're in this open source culture where everybody is willing to really help with whatever you need. Um, it just has to make sense, you know, building well, yeah. that community. And I even love the, the, just this right here. Like you, you're two separate creative directors at two separate labels, sort of talk and shop. And, and you guys have clearly a great relationship with each other where it's much more about collaboration than it is about competition. So 
that's really really cool to see and is is not that way with all parts of the industry <laughs> it's, yeah it's, yeah for sure i mean w- w- we've had the opportunity to work together we you know we're good friends and we i, f- I feel like we both really want each other to succeed yeah um and i i honestly think that more people are like that than we think. I think that if people aren't that way, it's all fear-based. Yeah. Um, it's competition. I, I found in our industry is all people that are just scared yeah. that they're not going to have a job anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's just not an area. I, I, I'm old enough now to know that um, I want to work with people that I care about. And um, it doesn't really matter uh the yeah. the companies that we're a part of. Sure. I just want to be around good people. Yeah. yeah. And I would say both of our labels are kind of built from this idea of artists first, um, which is not necessarily typical of the industry, but um, both of us, like that's our labels are built as cheerleaders uh, for our artists. And so that, that kind of comes from the top down and for us to, to, you know, we're encouraged to, reach out to each other and to work with other people in the industry. And, you know, we are kind of all in this together trying yeah. to make great art for great people. And, and I do, I think that comes from just kind of the, the backgrounds of our, our labels and kind of what their, what their missions are really. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Well, uh, are you guys ready to jump into my favorite part of the show, the lightning round? Yeah. <laughs> Number one, favorite Nashville meeting spot. Oh gosh. Um, dead air. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, I meet <laughs> the, the Starbucks down the road. I don't know. That's where I seem to always meet. I don't know if it's my favorite. That's yeah, just where I'd I meet. I, my favorite is uh, West Nashville Frothy Monkey. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, that's right down the street for me. I love that place. All right, good. That's a much better answer. Yeah, (laughs) we should just both answer these questions. (laughs) Sure. Okay, and we'll see who's we'll see whose answer's better. (laughs) Exactly. There you go. Uh, Number two, most awkward creative meeting moment. (laughs) You don't have to name names. I know yours. (laughs) Do you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm blanking. Remix. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah, I would say I don't know how to answer that question. I feel like I do we say this, no comment? This, this isn't necessarily a creative meeting, but creative process. Okay. Can I answer it that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. I was doing a record for an artist who came and sat in my office and watched every single move that I made wow. in creating this packaging, and it was like, oh, can you move that a, a little bit to the left? And then I would have to print it out <laughs> and cut it out and put it in a CD case wow. so this artist could see what it looked like when I moved it like six pixels to the left or whatever. Wow. Or get, change the color. Can you make it a little more purple instead of a little more blue? And now let's print it out and see what that looks like <laughs> for like 12 hours. So that's mine as well because I called him after I had been home. I called him and he was talking in code because the artist was right there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'll be there in 20 minutes. And I literally like went up there and had to like, so how are we doing? Oh, I think this looks great. Let's, are we ready to wrap? Like I tried tried to move it along. Yeah. That was, that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like super early in my career too. So I wasn't like (laughs) comfortable enough to be like, all right, we're done. Like we got to cut it out. Yeah. That would not happen today. Um, Yeah. It was wild. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Um, You're probably both going to have separate answers on this unless you're not. Favorite album packaging of all time? Oh, Ooh. of all time. And of, mm. oh gosh, I'm all, I'm so conscious of dead air. I don't know, um, yeah. like that we've worked on, or no, just, just period. It could period. be if you if you genuinely think something you've worked on is the best of all time. Oh gosh. Oh no, that's definitely that. not. Yeah, not the case. Okay. Uh, this is a nostalgic moment. So okay. I, when I was growing up, my dad had an LP collection that I would look through all the time. And I think that's where I really found my love for album covers. And he had a, and I hope I get this right. I think it was a Uriah Heap record that was designed, uh, that the art was H.R. Geiger, who it was like the guy that did 
alien movies. Mm -hmm. And it was like this multi-fold, like, like part of the cover was revealed when you pulled it back. And it was so great. And I hope that's the right album, but it was a HR Geiger cover LP. I think it was your good, good answer. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's still a better answer than I have. I'm, there's so many packages that I love and respect. It's hard to like pick a total favorite. I would, can I, can I say album cover? Yeah. Does that sure. work? Yeah. yeah. Packaging. Yeah. Um, it might be again, a cliche kind of answer, but, uh, the Velvet Underground cover that was done by Warhol with oh, the banana on. on it. Yeah. Like it's so iconic that people that have never heard Velvet Underground, people that have never like even listened to rock music, like they've seen that banana. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that is yeah. like that's a thing. Yeah. And if you can create that kind of or even like the Nirvana cover with the baby on it, like I aspire to one day make any single cover that people <laughs> see it and they're like, oh yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. Like they know what it is. Yeah. yeah, I think, and that's that cool thing about collaborating with like fine artists. You know, like in both of our instances, it was people that were successful in art that were partnering with music, and I think there's yeah. something really cool there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first concert. Oh gosh, this is embarrassing. Do it. What is it? Um, yeah, you know, I was I think ten or eleven years old, and it was a birthday party. This was like a a, a girl in my class whose parents like bought a bunch of tickets for everyone, and it was. New Kids on the Block. Mm. Yeah. That's, a, that's a better answer than mine. <laughs> What's yours? I think, I think my first concert was the Newsboys. <laughs> Which tour? Uh, it would have been like going public. Okay. I yeah. think. Like Shine. Yeah. 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 I think that was like, it, as far as like first concert that I went to on my own, that I bought tickets to kind of thing. Yeah. I remember my parents dropping me and my friend Justin off. Yeah, it I think that was the first one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's the awesome. drum kit that would spin. Right, yeah, call yeah. that. Yeah. Wow. Um, and lastly, favorite creative design tool. Oh gosh, man, I love Photoshop. I I just I could spend all day, and, and like the art that I make personally for just my own thing uh i do all in photoshop mm -hmm. it's manipulating photos and i kind of do like surrealist stuff that um photoshop is just key to yeah. i can spend all day in photoshop yeah oh totally and it's and you never are um it it you're never great at it like there are, i know some people that are great at it but like i am always learning something new and you think that doing this as long as you're you can always be taught some new way to do something in Photoshop. I would say that mine's like, like really my, my tablet. Like, uh, I have a, a Wacom is it Wacom or Wacom or Wacom Wacom. Let's go with Wacom. What do you do with a dog? You walk. Em. Ah, did, did they, <laughs> is that really it? Yeah. Yeah. What do you do with a dog? You that, walk them. That's all. Awesome. My Wacom tablet. I like it because there's a little, I grew, I started off as like a, a hand illustrator and I don't get to do much of that anymore. So like even retouching photos using a tablet, adds this sort of mm -hmm. tactile nature to what I'm doing. So I think it's fun. Yeah. That changed, that thing changed my workflow completely. Yeah. When I started using a tablet for everything, I don't even have a mouse anymore. I use that tablet. For wow. It also makes you look like, you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like even if you people don't. walk over and they're like, Oh, oh. he has a tablet. He must be wow. creative. Yeah. I what should probably, I should probably get one for my songwriting sessions. Yeah. yeah. Will yeah. that make me look smarter? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I'll just, no, it's like for something. you guys, it's like your volume knob. It yeah. looks like really rad and you just kind of fiddle with it. It makes you look like you totally <laughs> know what you're doing. When I when I, d I took an audio engineering class in college and I, the, I realized that like all mixing boards, it's just like if you learn one channel, um, one knob, you know yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. But you can sit at consoles with like 100 channels and just look like the man and literally like it, it's you're playing with two knobs the yeah, whole time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's what I like design. So closing out, how can people interact with you guys? Social media, emails, if you feel like giving that. What, what, how can people find you, find your work online? Website? Uh, Instagram is probably the best for me. Yeah. Um, WRZL.JPEG is my – JPG is okay. my handle. Yeah. Um, I'll give out my email address. I'm, I ain't scared. There you go. Mine is jason.jones at integritymusic.com. Okay. And uh, yeah, I would say that I love like engaging with people that um, I, I feel like I'm at a point in my career that I'm just trying to pay forward all the things that I've done wrong. 
Hmm. You know, because I feel like <laughs> I know how to. I know how to. I, I've done a lot more wrong that I've done right, and I think that if I can share that with anybody, um, I'm happy to. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to be doing a deep dive on creating content that is truly shareable. Uh, right after this and people can find that out at madeitinmusic.com. They can go to the show notes page and they can check that out. But Jason, Josh, thank you so much for being with us on the Made It Music podcast. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks, man. This is great. Hey, what's up? Thanks for hanging out on this YouTube video with us. In case you didn't know, this is from the Made It in Music podcast season two. We have a ton of awesome guests that come on the show, all music business professionals to share their knowledge and experience with you. So if you want to subscribe to not miss any future episodes, hit that subscribe button on YouTube and you'll be notified about all of them. And in case you didn't know, we do a deep dive for every episode where we go really in depth on a certain topic from each podcast episode. So sign up right here to get free unlimited access to all of those deep dives from our podcast. And if you want to watch another Made It in Music podcast video, click here.